Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on MovieHouseMemories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. You're listening to Lunchtime Movie Review from LunchtimeMovieReview.com, and we are the children of the 80s. The children of the 80s are back with another review of one of our childhood favorites. This week, we're reviewing Planes, Trains, and Automobiles from 1987. I'm Patrick. I'm Bobby. I'm Chad. G'day, I'm Shane. You guys figured it out all on your own. I didn't even have to tell you to do alphabetical. So, all right. I, I love working with professionals. That's all I have to say. It's just love it. All right. And as I stated, we're reviewing 1987's Planes, Trains, and Automobiles with Steve Martin and John Candy. But before we get into our review of that lovely film, first a word from our sponsor. This movie is brought to you by Open Up Car Factory. We have a brand new range of cars that have been reassessed or re designed after car accidents explosions of the motor or even if the interior has been fully burnt out our open up car procedure fully conditioned to get you back on the road and compliable with most state road laws you have a choice of sedans with no roof only a shell or a station wagon with no doors there's even a minivan without the van just a cab and a shift stick Sure, you cannot drive safely in the snow or rain or heavy fog, and smokers will have diff- very much difficulty sparking up, but our open-up car factory is the recycle image of the future. Coming soon, planes with no windows and trains with no electrics, re- relying solely on wind power pulleys on the tracks. Open-up car factory is just the beginning. Is a receipt required? <laughs> yes, I, I think they're already there, just melted. <laughs> all right who has the summary this week uh that would be me all right let's hear it, chad it is two days before thanksgiving and ad executive neil page desperately wants to get out of new york city neil's wife is expecting him to catch his 6 p.m flight back to chicago and be home safely by 10 p.m After Neil loses out on a taxi cab to a Kevin Bacon doppelganger, he has another cab stolen by former Wally World security guard Del Griffith. Neil eventually meets Del face-to-face in LaGuardia Airport while waiting for their flight to Chicago. When Neil's first-class ticket is downgraded to the coach section of the plane, he is punished by being forced to sit next to his new acquaintance, Del Griffith. During the flight, Dell stops talking just long enough to take his shoes and socks off, making Neil nauseous. If Neil's flight wasn't bad enough, the plane is rerouted mid-flight to Wichita, Kansas, after a major snowstorm blankets Chicago. Dell, who is a million bucks shy of being a millionaire, uses his influence as a shower curtain ring salesman to get the duo the last motel room in all of Wichita. When the twosome gets to their room, they learn they must share a double bed, which Dell immediately spills beer all over. While Neil tries to sleep, Dell clears out his sinuses by making loud snorting sounds. An irritated Neil screams at Dell, calling him a total loser and a chatty Cathy doll. A very hurt Dell expresses to Neil that he likes himself and won't change because he is, quote, real, unquote. After they calm down, the duo are able to get a good night's sleep. Neil and Dell wake up ne- the next morning spooning, with Dell kissing Neil's ear and his hands placed between two pillows. But those are pillows! While Neil and Dell were sleeping in their affectionate embrace, a former summer school student named Dave broke into their motel room and stole all their cash. The duo must resort to using Neil's credit cards to secure train tickets to Chicago. Unfortunately, the train blows its engine, forcing all passengers to evacuate the passenger cars and walk through muddy fields to the nearest highway and commercial buses. The pair decides to stick with the bus line and purchase tickets to St. Louis. Dell makes the most of the trip by leading the passengers in a steering rendition of the Flintstones theme song. Wilma! 
A penniless Dell cons rubes throughout the St. Louis bus station into buying his shower curtain rings, telling them the curtain rings are fashionable earrings. The money he collects buys his transportation to Chicago. Neil decides to go his own way and drive a rental car from St. Louis to Chicago. When Neil learns his rental car doesn't exist, he has a very Steve Martin-like dance of rage, destroys the rental agreement, and is told he is fucked by Principal Ed Rooney's secretary. Fortunately for Neil, Dell pulls up in a rented family truckster convertible, and they drive off to Chicago. After Dell inadvertently takes an exit ramp to prevent one car crash, he uses the same exit ramp to re-enter the interstate and drives the wrong way down the one-way lane. Dell miraculously squeezes between two semis to save their lives, but later catches the truckster on fire when his lit cigarette lands in the back seat of the car. While Neil hysterically laughs about the blazing car, Dell confesses that he used Neil's credit card to rent the truckster, and the same credit card is now burning up along with Neil's wallet in the car's glove compartment. The ice cover duo drive the burnt car to a nearby hotel, where Neil gets a room for $17 and a very nice watch. But the destitute Dell unfortunately cannot rent a room. Neil saves Dell from freezing to death in a burnt up car, which has no roof, no windows, and no doors, by allowing him to sleep in the motel room. After a night of drinking and laughing, they decide to drive straight through to Chicago. If matters couldn't get any worse, Dell is pulled over for speeding and the scorched car is impounded by a Michael McKeon doppelganger for being undrivable. Neil and Dell secure a ride into Chicago from a semi-driver, but they must sit in a refrigerated cargo trailer for the entire trip. After finally arriving in Chicago, the duo says their goodbyes at a CTA station, hug it out, and wish each other a happy Thanksgiving. While riding home on the train, Neil realizes that Dell provided him with ambiguous details about his life and retreats to the train station to find Dell. Dell informs Neil that he doesn't have a home to go to, and his wife, the love of his life, has been dead for eight years. A very compassionate Neil takes Dell home to have Thanksgiving dinner with his family. After two days of hell, Neil rings his own doorbell, introduces Dell to his family, and brings a giant smile to Dell's face by making him a part of the very loving Page family. The end. All right. Planes, Trains, and Automobiles was released on November 25th, 1987, the same day as Three Men and a Baby, uh, the same month as The Running Man, Ruski's Flowers in the Attic, Less Than Zero, Hiding Out, Death Wish 4, The Crackdown, Hello Again, and Chad's favorite film of all time, Teen Wolf 2. Uh, it grossed. Oh, I love Jason Bateman. <laughs> Uh, made on a budget of $30 million, grossed just over $49 million, making it the 21st highest grossing film of 1987, right behind such classics as Broadcast News, uh, Shane's favorite film, The Living Daylights, and Eddie Murphy Raw, and right in front of the re-release of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs, Full Metal Jacket, and Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors, The Empire Strikes Back of that uh, franchise. Uh, John Candy was nominated for an award for this film, the American Comedy Award, uh, under the category of fun Funniest Actor in a Motion Picture in a Leading Role, lost to Robin Williams for Good Morning Vietnam, one of Roger Ebert's greatest movies, or listed in the book, The Greatest Movies, and Sh Shane's favorite statistic, Rotten Tomatoes has it at 92% critics and 87% audience. So that is the statistics and numbers on Planes, Trains. All right. Uh, well, let's start off with this is a John Hughes film, uh, the man who basically put his stamp on teen movies in the 80s and then went to kiddie films in the 90s. This is kind of the uh, kind of a branch off for a period of time where he does some adult, well, I don't want to say adult themed films, but more adult uh, uh, comedies. Uh, what did you guys think of this as a John Hughes film? 
I was such a John Hughes fan of the teenage years that this was kind of an alternate take that I, I wasn't quite ready for when it came out. Um, I think I've appreciated this more the older I get to be a little closer to the ages of the guys that are in the movie. But when I was still younger, I think I still preferred the John Hughes previous versions, the the eighties of the of the Brat Pack and so on, a little bit more than than this one. Yeah, I was a massive fan, obviously, of John Hughes as well. And I saw this when it was released in the cinema, but we didn't get released here until Boxing Day uh, 1987. So that's Jan- that's December the 26th. I think I probably would have seen it in January, though, um, in the school holidays or whatever. But I loved it. I actually thought it was hilarious. It spoke to me in some ways because it was a little bit more adult to some of the John Hughes movies previously. And I saw a lot of more adult films as a kid, so maybe that's why I appreciated the humour more and I loved it back then. It made me crack up. I didn't see this movie till late on. I don't know why. I just I It was probably the mid-90s where I saw it. And um, I always liked all of John Hughes' films. I liked Steve Martin. I liked John Candy. And they've always been a staple in my life when it comes to comedies and movies. But I didn't see it until late. But once I saw it, I fell in love with it. I think it's hilarious. It's well done all the way around. I try to watch it about every year or two around the holiday time because it's just one of those fun, I guess, family movies that you can sit down and watch and feel good about life and all that. And the laughs will hold up every time you watch it. Yeah, I, this is not one I caught in the theaters. I caught it on video when it came out the next year. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, it was not, although it came out right before Thanksgiving, it wasn't really advertised as a Thanksgiving movie, and I didn't see it as that when I originally rented it. And then it was like, oh, it's a Thanksgiving movie. But then it's not really a Thanksgiving movie. And kind of like Bobby, I didn't really appreciate it in its time because I was used to the John Hughes of breakfast club and 16 candles and pretty in pink that that was the the teen movies and this is the era that he kind of moved into this one uh she's having a baby the great outdoors where he's using more adult actors doing kind of adult stories and not focusing on the teens as as much anymore and that's uh, that's why i think i didn't appreciate it in its time years later i saw it again around thanksgiving uh in a period of time where i was living away from my family and I got back for Christmas every year, but I never got back for Thanksgiving. And I, I really liked this film once I could relate to one of the themes of being away from your family for an important holiday. So I, I came to like it a lot more years later. Uh, and I think the humor in it is uh, a much more adult oriented. I didn't think it was as funny as a kid, but as an adult, I thought it really played off a, a lot better. Or it plays a little bit more interesting to an adult, not so much to a teenage kid. This is an R-rated film, uh, which is unusual, um, and mainly for one scene of the uh, 18 fucks uh, in the scene in the rent-a-car line. Uh, so, uh, wh- uh, what do you think about that? I mean, that that's a that's a specific choice of saying, "Hey, the entire film is very PG, and we're going to blow it in one scene." Can can we do it? It, it was it it was it that funny of a scene that you think it absolutely needed to be in there that you could you couldn't appeal to a wider audience uh, with a PG rating. Uh, I thought it was funny then, but not as funny now. I think it's a little bit excessive. But if it, you, uh, that might have uh, the reason behind that might be because I've probably seen that scene a hundred times, so uh, I could be immune to it. I think if you're watching it. On the other hand, for the first time and you saw that scene and you weren't offended by swearing, you'd, you'd think it was hilarious. But now, I don't think it's as funny as it was back then. Uh, I I respect the fact they went balls to the walls and said, okay, we're going to go with an R and keep this, film in, or keep this scene in this film in that manner because eventually one of these guys is going to have a breakdown and start saying fuck every 19 seconds or whatever it is, just because they're going to have that breakdown. To me, it feels natural. And then if you want to have the film edited for TV, that's all you have to deal with is changing one scene. You don't have to change everything else for the most part. So I think it's apropos. I think eventually these guys would have had that verbal breakdown arguing with somebody 
and it would be a natural way of arguing. So I respect it. I'm glad that John Hughes and the um, studio stuck with it, and even though it is a holiday-ish film, go with it, because I think they showed what the human, real human nature was. I, I think that this is a scene that needed to be in the movie. I think that the breakdown was natural, just like Chad said, and I think my understanding was that Steve Martin, when he was choosing to play the role or not, one of the two scenes that brought him in specifically was the fuck scene. <laughs> and I think that that part, I, I believe that not only was it done as in a PG movie and they just threw the rating away and just said, I'm going to make the movie that fits. I think that this is something that I, I, I laugh. I mean, I've seen this movie five, six, seven times. I don't know the number, but every time I watch it, I laugh because Steve Martin's delivery. And then what's her name? Edie, uh, the, the lady, the, the, the counter lady. Edie McGurk is her name. Yeah, um, she, she her her face through the whole thing. I think the two actors were so perfect in the in that scene that it made that movie. It, it, I it's not it's not its heart obviously, but I think it showed the the true the the heart of Steve Martin's character of just come on enough and this is how I explode. Had he have reached across the counter and grabbed Edie's throat and said it, I think I would have been offended by it. But the fact that he just did it because he's so angry and so frustrated and boom, here it comes. And then her response back, I believe that that was one of the funniest parts of the whole movie and it had to be there. Yeah, it's I'm not offended by the F word. So it's mm-hmm. it's I think it, and when it's properly used for emphasis, it can be hilarious this is a scene that i think it needed it it really does convey convey his frustration with the entire trip that everything he's gone through throughout the course of the movie and that he just reaches his breaking point but because he gets to that breaking point he also uh, he gets his just desserts by go by snapping there because <laughs> he you know he he doesn't use his uh his common sense and uh, you know i think he gets repercussions for that as well and i think that's i think that was an effective story point that he couldn't be a little bit more patient with people at that moment yep. Yep. all right uh, this <laughs> this is as I, we kind of stated is a Thanksgiving themed film about is basically he's trying to get um, home to his family for Thanksgiving although you you just see he just gets there at the end and Thanksgiving time at least in the United States well Shane and Thanksgiving it's it's a holiday we celebrate you probably know <laughs> nothing about. Um, <laughs> It's where the pilgrims came over and, and met with the Indians, and they and they it got together in, in a mutual harmony and had a meal right before the pilgrims took over all the Indians' land. Um, but uh, so it happens in November. It's a big film release time. Right before Thanksgiving is kind of the official start of the holiday season, or at least until Marvel films start coming out in early November. But uh, that's. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, I'm always surprised because we get Christmas films every year. Why don't we get more Thanksgiving films? Because I can think of this. I can think of Home for the Holidays. And that's about it as far as Thanksgiving films. I can't think of another one off the top of my head. Well, I, came to, I came to Dutch right away because I, yep. oh, I forgot Dutch. John Hughes movie. Yeah, and that's basically the Planes, Trains, and Automobiles ripoff, if you will, even. <laughs> No, he, it was written by John Hughes. It's basically the same premise. And then my other one that I had was Alice's Restaurant, which it takes off of uh, Arlo Guthrie's song by the same name. And those were the only two I really came up with that really focus on Thanksgiving. Yeah, but that's four films in almost 100 years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I have a couple more. Is uh, I have Pieces of April, which, again, is it's not a great movie, but it does have the Thanksgiving theme to it. And then Son-in-Law is when he's oh, actually headed right. back to the farm for the Thanksgiving break with, uh, with the daughter. So um, those are the ones that but once again, like you just said, there's six ish, seven ish titles out of many, many thousands of titles that have Thanksgiving, which is one of the biggest holidays in America. 
Yeah. So, I mean, everything shuts and, down and, on Thanksgiving. And warm. It's one of those homecoming warm movie or right. uh, holidays. It, yeah. It's a lot of the same themes that you see in Christmas films. This is like the Thanksgiving is a backdrop. It's not the holiday itself. Like Home for the Holidays is it's all about the Thanksgiving. That is, you know, and what, right. what it's like to come back to a basically screwed up family. Although a really good film. Uh, so, so why don't you th- why don't you think they make Thanksgiving films? I have a theory. Okay, I think it's the same theory that we have with our shopping days. Is that Thanksgiving has become a leapfrog into Black Friday for Christmas? You have Halloween, a big break for the for um, all of the sales that are going on, and let's have a, a really nice meal one day, and then the ne- very that night. I mean, honestly, Black Friday is now Black Thursday and on Thanksgiving itself and right into Christmas. So I think the f- family with the with the current generation, I think, has become less important. And I think it's now all about the party with the Halloween and right into g- give me, give me, give me on Christmas. So that's my theory. Oh, I was going to say, I was probably introduced to Thanksgiving through the Brady Bunch episode. <laughs> where they dressed up as pilgrims and did a show mm-hmm. or something. Um, right. And I still am not clear on what Thanksgiving is. And the movie Dutch, I really actually quite like with Ed O'Neill. It wasn't called Dutch down under. It was called Driving Me Crazy. So I just thought I'd let you know that the alternate title of Dutch was Drive Me Crazy. I like Dutch better. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, mean, I wonder. Titles I wonder, all the time down here. I don't know why, but Dutch. I would assume if people saw it, they wouldn't maybe think it was a a comedy of you know a road comedy or whatever. Huh. They just changed it to driving me crazy, which is pretty standard. I know, but I liked it. I saw it at the movies in '91 when it was released. Mm-hmm. But you're right; it's very similar to this. Yeah, I don't understand why they can't go with. Uh, I'm like you, Patrick. Why can't they go with some kind of a thanksgiving type uh, script into a movie where you know the family gets together and you spend the day basically breaking the family apart and putting it back together and trying to figure out all the family's flaws you know little things like that that happen on thanksgiving day when everybody's reminiscing about the past and all that good stuff i'm surprised no one's taken that premise and ran with it and tried to make the most out of it but yeah i mean and other than this one, Dutch, and I know they sort of hit on some part of Thanksgiving in the Big Chill, but I can't remember if that was in the past or in the present day when everybody got together. But it, there's that opportunity to do something there with the family dynamic and examining the family dynamic on Thanksgiving Day. So hopefully somebody will do it one day. Yeah. Well, they did with, I mean, Pocahontas and basically anything with John Smith. So like, uh, a new world, anything along those lines. And for Shane, that's the the premise is the pilgrims coming in and uh, is, is that time frame. But I, I think that once again, you have a, something that people really want to feel as a family and watch all the things fall apart and let's put them all back together has been done a million times in different movies of all, all across the year and completely non holiday movies. They do that. So, making it just throw a turkey in the oven and call it a Thanksgiving movie isn't necessarily going to make a difference to people. I don't know. I mean, there's a, when you sit here and talk and we talk about uh, Christmas movies, we go, there's not, I mean, mm-hmm. we go, it's yeah. a good Christmas movie because we have a lower standard. There's very few films that are great films and well, as well as a Christmas movie when it comes to like Thanksgiving films, there's but a handful, six that we came off up with off the top of our heads and yeah. arguably, I could say only possibly maybe two of them or maybe three of them are really good. You know, there's, mm-hmm. I mean, right. the, the, and, and definitely not something that, you know, planes, trains you'll find on television universally around Thanksgiving time. Home for the holidays occasionally. It's a little, a little more niche. I, pieces of April and son in law, I hardly ever see on the television ever. Uh, and what were the other two? Alice's restaurant, yeah, the, no Dutch, way. Home for the holidays, a Dutch, Dutch, yeah, yeah. D- D- I haven't seen Dutch, and I love Home for the Holidays. Actually, that's a little underrated. A good film. No, it's a mm-hmm. great I, film. I, I do. also think what we're saying is what movie studios and execs do in the suits that green light films 
they want universal appeal. So the only way, uh, tr uh, you know, unless it's going to not just cover Thanksgiving and co cover uh, an entire, you know, different uh, holiday period or uh, a journey of such, I think that the only way a Thanksgiving movie will get made these days on a high level would be made for television, uh, you know, a home a home video movie or something or a streaming movie because the film studios want movies to appeal to the entire world. And if That's you've got true. just a Thanksgiving-themed movie, unless you've got maybe Meryl Streep or, or someone, you know, that's going to bring it to a higher level, I don't think they want to make them. Mm -hmm. That's true. I mean, but I mean, back in the '90s, it was less of a global um, market. Although there were some films that had global appeal, but now the studios count on the world cinema box office as much, if not more, than the United States box office to make back their money. So, and you, Thanksgiving does not necessarily translate over in China. <laughs> and to me, I never thought of planes, trains, and automobile as, as a Thanksgiving movie. Like it was just a comedy from the '80s to me growing up, and it's only recently now, only because we don't have Thanksgiving and and it's not as you know we don't really celebrate it. So to me, it was just a comedy. But to you guys, it was a Thanksgiving theme film. Well, I I agree somewhat with that, Shane. But the, I this is where I think I I differ from a lot of the people out there who do just pinhole this as a Thanksgiving movie. Because to be honest with you, this is a well written movie that goes basically two guys are trying to travel to point you know point Z, and they're going through all of these difficulties to get to yeah. it to to a party at the end. Because Thanksgiving to me wasn't really that big of a theme. I know it is a Thanksgiving movie, obviously. Everybody targets it as such. But Steve and John in the movie, they're these guys are just in trouble and they're trying to survive to get to a family thing at the end. So it, it just happens to be in the middle of winter. They could have stuck Christmas at the end of this. Yep. They, they could have had New Year's. They could have had, you know, Easter. It could have been just about any time, any holiday. This one just happens to be Thanksgiving. So I, I don't necessarily think it's Thanksgiving only. It just happens to be the holiday that John, John Hughes picked. That's all. Yeah. Fair point. But another thing that Bobby hit on how great of a, or how well written this movie is, I think yes, it's an extremely well written film, great story, and the the stunts, bits, whatever that all these people have to go through, especially the two leads. But I think as Patrick noted it, uh, previously, and maybe the notes or something that this was once a three hour film that was edited down to a ninety minutes and. I think the editing in this movie is the true winner here because you could just do Pratt fall stunt joke cutesy bit here and there for two, two and a half hours, and it would be a shit film in the grand scheme of it. But how tightly this thing has been edited down to 90 minutes, to me, saves the film entirely. Yes, Steve Martin's acting is great. John Candy's acting is great. The directing and the uh, writing are great, but... I think the editing is the true hero in this film. Yeah, and I'm not surprised there's a longer cut. Almost every film has a longer cut. You know, that's the and that's where you start making your sacrifices of what moves the story, what doesn't. Uh, Heaven's that's, Gate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, never lived that one down. What was she? Yeah, that's a version. Bring of it on! I want to watch eight hours of that. <laughs> <laughs> Sick man. And for next month's review, we review the extended cut of Heaven's Gate. Right. And then we'll wish for Thanksgiving because we would have survived that. Thanksgiving it, will have arrived, man. I'm telling you. Yeah. Even then, Shane would be like, I understand what you can be thankful for now. That's what I really believe. All right. Uh, but, it, you know, that this is a, it's a pretty tightly cut film. And it, the, how short it actually is, it's, it's weird because I remember this is a much longer film, but it's a, it's, a, mm. it's a standard comedy length, 90 minutes, get in and out. Yeah. And there's some gimmicks in it. Uh, but uh, it's I, I kind of wonder what story points you have in the film that take you to three hours and 40 minutes, you know, like it that is the, you know, sitting in the bus station scene go on for another 20 minutes or, you know, what what could you have added to this film? Because they have a lot of misadventures, but I don't I don't feel that they, you know, needed to. I wish they would have stayed in, in that scene or extended this out. There's nothing where I'm going. 
I needed more of that, especially in light of the fact that there's only two leads. That you're only focusing on two people the entire time. Well, I wonder also if if it's a three hour movie, how much of that you know there's it's notorious for the f bomb scene as the only real above pg level scene in it and i wonder if there's something in the remaining hour and a half that was cut out, cut out that could have added to that you know where it was it was actually more offensive in those scenes too so we'll never know obviously there's never going to be a director's cut at least not with their with john hughes approval on it so he, he might they might release the two hour version but even then i i can't believe that we would really care to see more this was so well done and, and I wanted to get back to the fact – originally I said that when I – you know, when I'm watching this movie back in the 80s when it came out and I'm I'm loving the the 16 Candles and Breakfast Club and, and you know, extremely well done teen type movies, this one I didn't get as much. Today, I think this is one of the best written John Hughes films of all time that he ever did as far as having the, the story all the way through truly – fleshing out all of the characters including some of the the cameos had their little their little shining moments i just believe this is this movie to me has aged just like a fine wine and especially the older the audience gets the more they would appreciate this movie all right well we have what one could argue is two of the biggest uh, comedic leads in the film in at least in the 80s uh, what did you think of the their individual performances as well as the how they bounced off the two of each other? I, uh, you can tell that their chemistry is on fire. They're really good and flawless. And just watching it again for this podcast, you, you pick up on little things just even when they look at each other and sitting next to each other on the plane and Steve Martin's playing with his tie and loosening it and just things like that, it's... They're great. They're at the top of their powers. Although I kind of like John Candy in Uncle Buck better. Another John Hughes movie. Now I know that's going to be shot down probably, but I, if I had to choose the two, I think John Candy sort of raises the stakes a bit in Uncle Buck. However, these two, I'll back you up on that, Shane. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, in this, I personally think that <laughs> you, you couldn't see anyone else other than Steve Martin and John Candy, you know? I'm, I'm Knowing John Hughes, he probably didn't audition them. He just said, I want you and I want you, and it works. Uh, I'll start with Steve Martin first. Steve was excellent in this movie, and to me, he was sort of in his prime, uh, in my opinion, at least with all the movies I liked. Uh, he went from uh, Three Amigos to Little Shop of Horrors to Roxanne, which I think is very underrated, in my opinion. It is. To... Planes, Trains, and Automobiles, to Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, to Parenthood. And yes, he sort of uses the same cliche antics in a lot of these films, but he's always great, and he always pops off the screen, and I think he does an excellent job in every role, and this one's no exception. And then John Candy, I mean, the dude, to me, has been around my whole life for the most part, because I always watched Second City TV um, he was there in, I believe, yeah, Vacation. He was there in Stripes. He was there in Volunteers. He was in Summer Rental. So many movies, but this is definitely his breakout role, and I think the role that gets him the most attention to go forward and do the Uncle Bucks and some of the other films in his career. But you can tell that these guys work well together as a team and off each other in probably in any ensemble piece because of their previous history working with uh, Second City and the Saturday Night Live people, that's just what makes their skill set so strong, and it shows in this movie that they're sharp, they're crisp with their comedy, they're not trying to be uber goofy, they're just very, very straightforward, and they don't need goofy laughs, they don't need bit lines or anything like that, they're just Dead great pan. comedians. Yeah, exactly. They can just do it straight, make it look straight, but it's hilarious as can be. It, well, it, I, I've been racking my brain trying to remember, were they ever in another movie together, or was this the only one? Even bit parts. I'm trying to remember if there was some sort of bleed over. Exactly. It, that's I don't my think th- so. 
I don't think so either. And that was that's I think that's why this movie to me is as special as it is because I agree with what Chad just said. They're both at their height of. I mean, John Candy actually. I think this was this was just on his uptick uh, on the acting. This was getting right towards toward the apex of the the superstar comedian steve martin was definitely right in the middle of his and i think you have two guys that i think if i was a fellow actor i would want to work with these two comedians because they are so good at making their co-stars and bit players shine also and then that makes them even better and i think they're they're both giving comedians and i think in this movie you have two guys that just rock together because they can they have such a such good timing between the two of them they're both extremely accomplished and just genuinely funny men and i I think that john hughes's script was put in their hands trusting them to deliver really good lines in the best comedian natural comedian way and i think it, it came into a really beautiful partnership that i wished maybe we could have seen more of but uh you know obviously that's not ever going to happen but yeah i i think both of these actors are are fantastic this movie was built for them and i don't think anybody else could have pulled this off the way they did in a tandem all right, and as a joke. side note, they did work it. Both work in Little Shop of, of Horrors, <laughs> as we both look it up in IMDb. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> gotcha. But they weren't in the same scene. No, right? no. So yeah, you, you know, because I, I, I have to be the naysayer. I love Steve Martin. When I was a kid, I remember him on SNL. I remember uh, the Jerk, and he really caught my eye as even as a small kid. And I liked those films, and I followed his career, and pretty much saw everything religiously uh, from him throughout the 80s and enjoyed the evolution as I got older and his comedy kind of matured away from things like the man with two brains and the jerk and wild stuff and like that guy. yeah wild and crazy guy to roles like this and planes trains parenthood uh, you know he kind of evolved as a, as an actor to a, a kind of a more mature comedy and I enjoyed that and then when he ultimately did some drama uh, like the Spanish prisoner I really enjoyed that the opposite side of the coin is John Candy, who I never really cared for that much. I thought he was a kind of a one-trick pony. He played the very, a very similar character in most of his films. I I didn't necessarily like. I didn't necessarily enjoy him, and when he was in films, I liked him in small doses. So when he was a supporting character, I thought he did well. That being said, I think this is one of the few films that I really like him in. I also really like him in Uncle Buck, so I will follow uh, uh, Shane with that one. Uncle Buck is a a very, very, very good film, and I think kind of made John Candy as a a lead actor at that time to kind of carry films. Prior to that, the armed and dangerous years and speed zone crap that he (laughs) pumped out from time to time, I'm sure just to to pay the bills, is I, I didn't like, never really enjoyed it. Not a fan of who's Harry Crumb. No. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> no, no. I like, I like that. No, didn't like that. Didn't like, like Shawnee Smith in it. That's Delirious. Did not like Delirious. Um, <laughs> only the lonely is okay. About, um, cool Runnings. Now that's a good film. Yeah, that's a good film, but he doesn't carry it. It's he's there, and he's and that's that's when I think he does work in films is because he's supporting. Uh, the kind of the main story is he's he's playing a character but it's not about his character it's about the other characters and their story and he's just a part of it and that's where he works really well in small doses like he he works very well in vacation he works uh, really well in little shop of horrors for the brief amount of time he's in it you know that's when i think he he plays i think he in small doses he doesn't uh, it doesn't overwhelm the film uh, when he's the lead guy he, he just becomes too slapsticky too annoying is what i i have to say i really like him in home alone i think he does a really good job in just the brief sequence he has he adds a little bit of emotion to it and there and the, but there are exceptions he's very good and like only the lonely is a very different role for him that uh, i enjoy playing of and i really did like his characterization in jfk and like to see that he did something completely different from for yeah. a period of time so 
but you know that's you know the two of them together work very very well in the film and i don't i don't want to take away anything from that this is one of the better performances by john candy if i was going to pick three or four performances or films to watch and say this is the best of john candy this would be one of them because uh, he he's definitely there but he gets to play off someone and he he get his role is to be kind of the goofy guy next to the straight man and that's and, and that's what his that's what he does that's just what he does <laughs> I never liked Steve, uh, Steve Martin until Roxanne. That was I just yeah. didn't care, care for the man and two brains and the jerk and that. I just didn't get it as get him as a kid, I guess, and liked him. But Roxanne and Chad brought that movie up. It's brilliant. It's underrated, and he's great, as you say, Patrick, in his uh, Spanish prisoner dramatic roles. Even Grand Canyon comes yes. to mind. He's very mm-hmm. very good in that. I just wanted to make one quick. Uh, point that uh, I'm glad that somebody made a movie about the travel or the nightmares of traveling in the United <laughs> States of America. How shitty it is dealing with airports, how shitty it is dealing with uh, plane passengers, hotels, motels, rental car people, and holiday travel. I've done enough traveling to know that 99.9% of the crap that happens in this movie happens every day in this world. And I'm just glad somebody brought it to light. Thank you, John Hughes. <laughs> yeah, I hate traveling. I'm not much of a traveler, so that's why it's taken me so long to get back over to the U.S., boys. But I'll be there eventually. <laughs> <laughs> we'll hold you to uh, that. <laughs> good, I will. 2020 is what I'm aiming at. All right. uh, what I'm trying to just bring up now, though, we, we met a couple of things. We touched on Edie McClurg just let's talk about her for a minute. She is a familiar face. She's always pops up in small roles. She's hilarious. And she was in Carrie. She was in the, the original Carrie yes. films. That's how long since she's been acting for. I think she even popped up in a Cheech and Chong movie or two. So she's been around and she's well loved. I interviewed someone once for the movie Frozen, the Disney movie, and Edie McGlurg does quite a lot of Disney voices these days, mm-hmm. voiceovers, and you should have heard the directors speak about Edie McGlurg. So she's well-loved within the industry, and she's hilarious, even though I don't laugh as much as I used to at the scene that she's in in this film, but I still love her. I want to make a point of that. And can I also mention the soundtrack? I, I had a copy of this soundtrack on cassette that I used to play to death, and it's such a mixtape of weird songs. You think about it, uh, from Red River Rock, you know, the, the instrumental to just some of these other tunes that are on there. Uh, I just thought it was a cool, alternate kind of fun soundtrack and always loved playing it when I um, had, had it. I don't have it anymore. And until this recent viewing of it, I never noticed the book that John Candy was reading in the airport until today, and that was the Canadian Mounted, and I thought that was pretty funny. (laughs) It was a a sex novel, obviously, (laughs) and John Candy's Canadian. So Steve Martin, isn't he? Oh, he could be. I'm not sure about him. I don't know about Steve. I think I thought, because he he grew up in Anaheim, because he worked at Knott's Berry Farm. That's where he learned... To play banjo and do all his balloon. No, I'm almost positive he's a U.S. citizen. Okay. So I have a copy of it. Uh, it's a special edition. It's called "Those Aren't Pillows" edition on DVD, <laughs> and it actually has one. And you were talking about a, a you know a three hour version of this. It only has one deleted scene, which is a, a little kind of comedic scene about airplane food. Um, they've cut it out, and it, it was it could, you could have left it in. It's kind of funny, but. Um, yeah, I was when you said there was a longer version of this, there should have been really more deleted scenes, I guess, on my DVD, but there is not. I'd like to find the screenplay for the the three hour version so you could at least read it just to see what was taken out. All right. Well, my closing point is the some the something that I grew to lo- love about this film is that despite all the slapstick, despite, you know, the kind of the silliness that these two characters go in the film, it takes a really dark turn in the last five minutes when you find out that Dell's wife has died and he is essentially homeless and just traveling all the time. That is really dark. 
and yeah. and it's it's kind of like I I remember I had a girlfriend in high school who I know I watched this film with her, and that's the sole reason she didn't like the the film is because it was just like it becomes really sad in the last five minutes. And although I I, I think it's actually kind of rewarding because he he finds a new family in in um, Steve Martin's family. So what did you guys think about that turn? Because it kind of comes out of nowhere. Uh, it does, but I didn't find it dark. I just thought, oh, typical American sugar-coated ending, make us cry. <laughs> yeah, it's it's something that they gave you enough clues for during the film. If you didn't know already, you weren't taking notice. I, I think John Candy's character was a little bit misunderstood, I think, through a lot of the movie in that, you know, he was the big schlub that was, you know, a screwball and, and didn't really have a, a, a point other than to be annoying. But I, I, I take it as a little bit, especially with the dark turn, it, it kind of seemed he flew by the seat of his pants all the time, it seemed. And, you know, obviously talking to his wife and so are the, the picture and so on, carrying it with him. What I kind of saw towards the end was, I kind of got it to the point where he became a partner to Steve Martin trying to get home to his family, and it became kind of – John Candy became a little bit more of a hero to me in that he was being selfless in trying to get somebody where they needed to go however possible. I mean it was terrible what was happening, but he was kind of working with Steve Martin to get him home no matter what, and when he finally did, it was just kind of like, okay, now what? And and I think that the fact that it became a bit dark because it had, they had to have that reveal, and I think that by allowing him the opportunity to finally see happiness again, even if it's you know a schlocky Hollywood ending, I I felt more passion towards John Candy's character <laughs> due to that arc than I would have if he was just a a pain in the ass all the way through the movie and then oh here here's a bone at the end. So that that's my take of the John Candy darkness. Uh, yes, I agree with you. The end seems weird uh, to me. I've always thought it seems a little weird. Um, I get it now after I've seen the movie probably 20 times that, okay, it's just part of the movie. But the first time I saw it, it just did, did feel a little out of place. I've always had a little bit of an issue with the way John Hughes movies end, but I won't bring up some kind of wonderful because I don't want to offend Shane A too much. Um <laughs> It's okay. But, you can offend me. I love that film. Like, I cry every time I see it. Which ending? That's, That's the question. Yeah, and the and it's another one of those movies where the John Hughes movie ends weird. And the same thing I felt about Pretty in Pink. Uh, I just think they try to get things a little too Hollywood with the endings in his movies. And this one just did feel weird. Now. I was thinking about this during my rewatch. The sort his character sort of reminds me of uh, George Clooney's character in Up in the Air, where he basically has no life. He just has to travel around as, for his job and doing whatever just to keep existing, basically. So I have a little bit more sympathy for the character from that point of view that he's just doing what he can to survive, and that's the only way he knows how to survive. But it doesn't make me feel any better about his character i feel bad for him more more than any but uh yeah just no matter what it just does feel a little bit weird and out of place all right well let's go around the horn and see if the film stands the test of time if if it says good bobby i think you've already articulated your opinion but uh does it stand the test of time yeah, I, I think this movie actually gets better the older it gets. Um, it's it's a movie that is enjoyable during the holiday season. It's one that can be watched any time. But it, you know, during the during the warmth of the holiday season, it's a nice lead into the Christmas season. Uh, I think, especially by the release of the podcast here, that we're releasing it around Thanksgiving is going to be really nice for folks. But I I think this movie is is it's never underrated because it's so people always talk about it but it's one of those movies that i think from the john hughes standpoint it's more of a mature john hughes that i think that's the part that's underrated is it's just another john hughes few, uh, film is unfair to plane strains and automobiles i think this one has is just a little cut above the the silly teenage romps and i think this one is one that 
as adults, I think, especially when you have a family of your own, if you were to put this in after never watching it for many, many years or never watching it before, I think you would get a, a more of an appreciation for this movie. So, yeah, as far as the standard test of time, yes. I think as far as a rating, I would probably rate this an eight or uh, eight and a half out of ten. I just this is a very wonderful movie and it's definitely worth watching. Chad. Yeah, I think it stands the test of time. I think it's one of the better written, performed, directed, and edited comedies of the 80s. It, these guys, they did a great job. I mean, they brought these characters to life. They pop off the screen no matter how often I watch this movie. And I just think anybody can relate to the nightmares of traveling if you've traveled at all and i think everybody can appreciate the family aspect of trying to get together for your family at the holidays so i think it does a great job and i think anybody who hasn't seen it should watch it and enjoy it and you'll want to watch it more and more but yeah it definitely stands the test of time shane of course it stands the test of time it's well loved i still love this film it's a well-written comedy drama, and like Chad says, I think Patrick also you, you mentioned the the editing. It's just so finely tuned to the exact point of comedy timing with these two. So you know, I, I, I do still enjoy it. I've seen it so many times, and I used to think it was hilarious. I used to crack up all the time, but I don't anymore. I don't know if I've turned into a, a, an old sour person or something, but I don't find it as funny anymore. The, the car scene when they're going the wrong way down the highway, that, that was great. The Edie McGlurg, you know, doesn't, you know, I don't know. Maybe I, different things appeal to me. Uh, I've seen that pillow scene so many times, I just don't even laugh at it anymore. But, you know, I, I, I like it and I would recommend it and it does stand the test of time. I have a tendency to annoy people sometimes. And it, I mean, I'm not Adele Griffith. Hopefully, no, no one's called no, me. No, 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 no! Don't say that. <laughs> um, but I have never met Adele Griffith either. So yeah, I mean, just the characterizations in these in this movie are spot on. Um, I just don't think it is as funny. It doesn't work for me as much as it used to. All right. Well, as I said, I didn't like it when I first saw it, uh, and grew to like it much better as i saw it later in life where i could appreciate some of the elements i didn't travel a lot when i was a kid so i didn't do a lot of like you know air, traveling in the plane until i was an adult and and the, having an understanding of how miserable as chad said the, the experience of traveling anywhere in the united states can be uh, i think that opened my eyes a lot to it uh, i do think it stands the test of time i will uh, arguably say it's the second best uh, thanksgiving film out there because i do still think of it as a thanksgiving film because of the theme um and i would what's the first best a home for the holidays i love that movie that is that's got some of the best one-liners in that film and i think it's just it's so interesting how to see I, i think there's just such a real element to the characters in that film home for the holidays i'm referring to as jodie foster directed that yeah and I, um, when I interviewed her, the second time I interviewed her, I brought it up. And, um, yeah, she was stoked that I actually brought it up because not a lot of people ask her about it. So it's good to know what's your first, your favorite yeah, I, Thanksgiving that, film. that was a surprise to me. That was a, a true, like, uh, diamond in the rough that I had not ever heard. I, I mean, I saw it on the shelf, but I hadn't actually watched it and then watched it and went, this is awesome. And I, I own that one because <laughs> I, I like it that much. But I highly recommend that one, as well as Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. So, All right. That does it for this week's review of Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Thanks again for joining us and listening to our little bi-weekly podcast. If you had a good time, the fun doesn't have to stop here. You can follow us on Facebook at Lunchtime Movie Review or on Twitter at Lunchtime Movie. On either Facebook or Twitter, you can keep up on our written film reviews, news on, on upcoming films and Blu-ray releases, and information on upcoming podcasts on the MHN Podcast Network. Again, if you've enjoyed yourselves and you've downloaded us off either iTunes or Stitcher, make sure to rate our podcast on either one of those two platforms. And if you have a chance, write a short review of the podcast. Of course, we always like the reviews that are positive, but we appreciate any feedback that we can get from any listeners of the show. Well, that does it for this episode of Lunchtime Move Review. Till next time, I'm Patrick. I'm Bobby. Happy Thanksgiving. I'm Chad. And I'm Shane A. Bye for now. All right. And we got to get out of here right now, and you guys are invited. 
This podcast is not endorsed by Paramount Home Entertainment as in, and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Planes, trains and automobiles, all names and sounds of planes, trains and automobiles, characters and any other planes, trains and automobiles related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Paramount Home Entertainment or their respective trademark and or copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of DMHM Podcast Network, Lunchtime Movie Review and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment LLC unless otherwise noted.